Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for what he has accomplished. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for forgiveness of sins that we have experienced and been granted through the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the privilege that it is to live our lives for you, for your purposes, for your glory. We thank you for your wisdom that as we do this, you receive the praise, you receive the glory, because we know that any good that comes from us is not us, but it is Christ in us. And so we look to him, we humbly depend upon him, we cling to him, and even now as we open up your word, we pray that Christ would be glorified and honored through our submission to you. Conform us more into his likeness, mold us into more useful instruments for your purposes and your glory as a result of this wonderful time that we get to experience as a family together. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. It is a joy to be with you. If you don't know me, I am Matt Kelso's younger brother. And so after this morning, you will have new ways to pray for your elder. He's a wonderful counselor and friend and brother, as all of the pastors at Grace Bible Church are. You all are precious to me. It's great to be with you. Greetings from Gilbert Bible Church. We miss you. We love you. We love this church. We feel our absence from you, even though it looks like you have already replaced us. <laughs> We're not bitter, okay? We're glad. Gilbert Bible Church is home for us now. For my family, we love it. We are being refreshed through what God is doing. It's a sweet fellowship. We're invigorated in ministry. We're encouraged by the kindness of the Lord and what he is doing, and we miss our friends here, and it warms our heart to be with you all. There will always be unique affection and profound love and appreciation for Grace Bible Church. Sometimes I feel conflicted sharing about Gilbert Bible Church when asked about how we are doing sharing all the encouraging things that God is doing, how much we love the ministry the Lord has given to us, because it feels like it might be heard somehow in contrast to what we were experiencing here. That is not the case. The encouragement of ministry, the vitality of body life, the reciprocal spiritual care that we experience as a church body, it is only a testimony of the extraordinary equipping and shepherding we received here for two decades before we were sent out. So thank you. Thank you, Grace Bible Church. Thank you for your encouragement, your continued care, and your prayers. I'd like to give you a brief report of what is going on at Gilbert Bible Church these days. Smed asked me to share. We continue to experience vibrant ministry, high participation in our fellowship groups or small groups, active service by our members. We've offered various classes. The most recent one we did was on parenting, primarily uh, emphasizing birth through five years old. We have plans for covering six years to preteen and then doing a class on parenting teenagers next year, Lord willing. We have an equipping ministry, our men's and women's ministry. We call it EQ for equipping men, equipping women. We cover the similar disciplines, the build and wellspring disciplines that you cover here. It's very similar to those ministries. And we have high participation, sweet involvement, eager growth. Families have been growing. We've had babies born in our church, members added. We have three currently signed up for our most recent baptism class that we are starting God is working in our precious small church. Numerically, we continue to grow at a slow and steady rate. We have about 230 that would call Gilbert Bible Church their home, which is wonderful. Uh, those that have been joining, as, as I mentioned, we were sent out with about 150. Those that have been joining are heavily involved, deeply connected. That's exactly what we were praying for and desire. And maybe one of the most exciting reports to give you is pertaining to Tyler Azeltine whom we officially appointed as an elder on August 26th. So now we have three elders, myself, Tom Engstead, and Tyler. And his service to Gilbert Bible Church has been extraordinary, which should not come 
as a surprise to anybody who knows him. He's faithful in everything he does, diligent, he is godly, he's wise. His shepherding presence has been felt and experienced in wonderful ways by all of us at Gilbert Bible Church. We continue to meet at our, for our corporate gathering on Saturday evenings at Discovery Community Church on Lindsay and Ray. We enjoy a wonderful partnership with them. That's been really a delightful surprise how kind and generous and hospitable they have been to us. They've really set the bar for hospitality, opening up their facility to us, making it so seamless and easy to have all sorts of different ministries on campus, and it's just a, been a wonderful, wonderful relationship. We still desire our own facility or one that would allow us to move to Sunday mornings. We pray for that. We look for that. We wait for that. We know God will provide it in his perfect time, and while we wait, we give thanks for his gracious, abundant provisions that he's given to us. That's a brief update on Gilbert Bible Church, about Grace Bible Church. You all must be emotionally exhausted. I was thinking about what you have had to go through by God's kindness and grace. It is that over the last several weeks, two weeks ago, you heard from Omri for the last time as a pastor of Grace Bible Church. Last week you sent him, we were here, and three precious families out to plant Grace Bible Church NOLA. And then to top it all off, you get to hear from me, the guy who just a year and a half ago took 150 of your closest friends. (laughs) Thank you for not rioting (laughs) yet. I appreciated what Kyle said last week and what I've heard Smedley say, that if these things were not hard, we would be doing it wrong. But why do we do it in the first place? I know our purpose as a church is to draw in, build up, and send out, but wouldn't it be easier if we just focused on those first two parts and neglected the last? Certainly may be more comfortable to not disrupt what we have worked to build. Isn't there a less painful way, a less disruptive way? Do we really need to send precious friends to Papua New Guinea and precious families to New Orleans and precious friends all the way to Gilbert? And inevitably, resounding, the answer is yes, we do. Why? Because God has said that that is what we are to be about as his church. God gave us this mission, this commission as his ambassadors to take his gospel to the ends of the earth. We must be committed to these things. And while it is painful and laborious, costly, this endeavor, it is inevitably successful. How do we know this? Because God is committed to building his church. God is committed to the progress of his gospel, working in his people. Why can it be hard and good? uncomfortable and satisfying, painful and inevitable because God is sovereign and is committed to growing his church, to saving souls, to building us up in his church, and that's what we're to be about. It's wrapped up in our identity, even as Scott Demarest shared earlier looking at Revelation. So please open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to see from God's word with me this morning the believer's identity connected to the body of Christ. That we have been saved, but we've been saved for a purpose. We've been saved to be built up together to live our lives for the glory of God. God's work in your salvation is much bigger than about just you only. If you're a believer, before the foundation of time, God predetermined whom he would save, had a salvation plan to draw you to himself. It involved Christ. He saved you from your depravity, awakened you from your spiritual death to make you alive in Christ by causing you to be born again unto a living hope. He called you out of your life of idolatry and separation rebellion, and in your salvation, he not only reconciled you to himself, but he also has reconciled us one to another, other believers into the body of Christ. 
And so your new identity in Christ brought about through the death and resurrection of Jesus includes an identity as one of God's people, connected and united with them in a local assembly that is the church. Christ died for you personally and individually, but for the purpose of you being a part of his bride. Intertwined in your identity in Christ is your identity as a member of the church. And in God's mind, this doesn't mean an abstract idea of a group of people across the globe who believe in Jesus. It's much more specific than that. God's intention is for every believer to be intimately connected with a local assembly consisting of known members, established qualified leadership, order, consistent participation in preaching and teaching and equipping, serving one another, singing, prayer, all of the one another commands that God calls the body of Christ to and more as well. Thus, to be a Christian and to live in isolation from others, to be aloof to the local church or even distant or disconnected practically, as this isn't just a verbal association, but it's an active one, and practice and commitment to being connected, to live outside of this. Anytime we live outside of this, we're living outside of our identity in Christ. We're living outside of God's intention for his people. Why do we labor for decades to equip men and disciple families and pour our lives out one into another only to send some of those people away to plant more churches? Because the church is that important and vital in God's plan for his people. It is so in the DNA of the people of God that we are part of the body of Christ. It's literally who we are, who we are to be in Christ. And in Ephesians 2, Paul puts forth this reality of the believer's new identity in Christ, being one that is vitally connected to other believers in the church because of the work of Jesus in the gospel. So let's look at our text for this morning. Read it. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 19. Ephesians 2, verse 19, God's word says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. In this passage, we see the gospel gives to you a new identity within the body of Christ described three ways. The gospel gives you a new identity within the body of Christ described three ways. Paul in our passage describes three ways your new identity in Christ is impacted because of the gospel, because of what Christ has done for us, saving us. And the gospel brings about a core identity level change for every believer. There's none who are excluded from this. Who you are and what you're to be about is directly impacted by the gospel. And in our passage, we see that described by Paul in three different ways. God has not left us to figure out who we are on our own as followers of Jesus Christ. There's not a go discover yourself or find out who you really are. Find your true self as a believer. God tells us exactly who we are in Christ and tells us how we are to live in light of this. And it involves being connected to one another in a local assembly. And how kind is it that we're not left to ourselves in the futility of our own speculation and conjecture? We aren't called to go figure out who we are. We're called to bring our lives into alignment with who God has made us to be. As followers of Jesus Christ, saved by the grace of God and given the great mercy of God, we're not to simply know who we are in Christ, but we're actually called to embrace it, to live it out faithfully. Live your identity out in obedience to Jesus Christ. 
Paul gets at this in our passage as he is describing the monumental shift the gospel has brought, particularly to the relationship and unity that Jews and Gentiles now have in the body of Christ. In verse 16, look down at verse 16 of chapter 2. Paul says that God reconciled them, both Jews and Gentiles, into one body to God through the cross. Where there was once enmity and hostility, he says in verse 17, there is now peace. In verse 18, those who were divided with clear distinction have mutual access in one spirit to the Father. This is culture-shattering realities that are taking place because of Christ. This unity and reconciliation both to God and together into one body would have been staggering to the original audience, shocking to them. And then in verse 19, Paul really narrows in on this new identity as one body that Christians experience. And that's where we see the first description of the new identity that each believer has. Number one, this new identity that you possess if you are in Christ is that we are fellow citizens with each other. It's number one. We are fellow citizens with each other. Look at verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens. That's the contrast of what you once were. But now, what? You are fellow citizens with the saints. It should cause our hearts to leap. Because of the death of Jesus, his sacrifice, Jew and Gentile have access to the Father. In light of this, Gentiles are no longer outsiders, separate from Christ. There aren't elevated statuses of citizenship, preferential treatment for some and not for others. We're co-citizens, we're fellow citizens, one with each other, with the saints, and we know that Saint here is not describing some special class of Christian, but is simply a term to describe every Christian as a holy one who is set apart by God for God's purposes. We together are citizens. We're saints, fellow citizens with each other. It's not some sort of super Christian or Christian with special powers. We are all, if you are in Christ, holy ones or saints, set apart ones, as fellow citizens with each other. We together are citizens. We possess all the rights, each one of us, that comes with being a citizen in this way. We understand this citizenship language and reality as formal citizens of a country. You possess specific rights that come with that, and so as the people of God joined together, we're citizens of his kingdom all with each other. There's no true believer that lacks this citizenship. The two groups that we knew prior to Christ, Jews who were God's people and Gentiles who were not God's people, have now been joined together into one group for those who believe as the people of God joined together as fellow citizens with each other. There's a oneness and sweet unity as fellow citizens that we are to experience. There's no second-class citizens, so to speak. Sometimes we might feel that way. Especially if we've come from a rough past or are just learning about God. Maybe you're new to the faith and you feel deficient. You look around and listen and people are using all sorts of language that you're unfamiliar with. All sorts of heart-shepherding terms that you're going, what is that about? You might feel like an outsider. This is new to me. I don't feel like I fit it in, like I fit in. Listen, your identity is a citizen. That's who you are in the body of Christ. Maybe you're struggling and in the heat of a battle against sin. Man, it just seems like every other Christian has their life together. Am I the only one struggling? As if that somehow affects your citizenship in the kingdom of God, and it certainly does not. You're no less a citizen. And in fact, you're a vital part of the people of God. It is this way for every believer. All of us are part of the people of God because all of us desperately needed grace, and if you are a true Christian, you have received it. That's, that's how we gain this citizenship. It's nothing to do with us and everything to do with Christ. 
The only reason any of us are part of God's kingdom as the people of God is because of the work of Jesus in the gospel. Jesus' work on the cross is what made it possible for us to be his people. So the gospel gives you a new identity within the body of Christ described three ways. First, we're fellow citizens with each other. And then next, Paul says, number two, we are of God's household. We are of God's household. Look again at verse 19. Paul says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints. And then he describes a, another category relating to our identity. He says, and are of God's household. To be a follower of Christ is to be a part of an actual family. And in fact, the love and intimacy of this family in God's household, it transcends any other familial relationship you might experience or be a part of. As the people of God, we are no longer strangers and aliens, but are corporately the church, the body of Christ, the household of God. We are the family of God. God is our heavenly father. We are his children because of Jesus. Altogether, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are members of the family of God. And again, this isn't just some ethereal idea of a family-like relationship. God has specificity in mind. We are joined together. We are connected in fellowship and relationship with each other. This family relationship that believers have one with another is to be most realized in the local church. I've heard many times people refer to their relationships with one another at Grace Bible Church or at Gilbert Bible Church as their true family, going far deeper than any other relationship that they have. My relationships here are more united, more intimate, more meaningful, more fruitful than any biological connection could create. Why? Why? because we're united in Christ. One with another to live and serve God. Our influence in one another's lives transcends the temporal. Do you realize that? Any earthly familial relationship that we experience, the best that it can offer impacts this life only. And yet the relationship that the Lord has given us, one with another in the body of Christ, it transcends this life and bears weight into eternity. That's God's intention. That's God's design. That's God's kindness to us. That we get to live our lives connected to one another in this way. We may have different talents, different interests, different personalities, different strengths, different weaknesses, different areas of giftedness, yet we are supernaturally united and connected because we are part of the same household. We're united in faith and part of the family of God. We are citizens of God's kingdom. And Paul narrows in not only on this wonderful reality, but we are also part of the same family. We have all the rights of citizenship and all the intimacy and love of family. And this familial relationship with each, with each other, it came at a price. This is only possible because of the work of Jesus. God is our Father. Because of this, we are our brothers and sisters. And it took the cost of Jesus' own blood to bring about this reconciliation, the forgiveness of sin, the entrance into this family. Do you see Grace Bible Church as your spiritual family? Sunday worship isn't an event you come to with other attenders. It's not what we're experiencing this morning. That's what, not what we're meant to experience this morning. It's a wonderful time of worship together as you join with your family in your household. All believers are brothers and sisters in Christ, but this is to be lived out locally in connection with other believers as the household of God. Are there family-like relationships in your life with those in this church? And this isn't on everyone else to be this way to you. Sometimes we 
entertain that sort of thinking. I come into a place, to an establishment, and I hold everybody else to standards that I myself am unwilling to live and abide by. They need to accept me. They need to embrace me. No, you need to embrace your identity as part of the household of God by giving of yourself in sacrificial love and care for others. You give of yourself for one another's good without regard to the personal cost of yourself. That's what it means to love one another. That's what we're called to in the body of Christ. You, me, each of us, we are called to live this out, loving each other with a unique familial intimacy and care. Have you positioned your life to nurture and support and grow this? Or are you content to perpetually be on the fringe? I'm going to appease my conscience by attending when it's convenient, but keep everybody at an arm's length. And I get it. Life gets full, and it can be so easy to find our communities where they fit within the natural flow of our life. Kids, school, sport teams, neighbors, work. Where does your church fit into these communities in your life? And before the Lord, what does he say is to take prominence? It can become so easy to let body life, family life in the local church fit into the fringes of our capacity, fit into the fringes of our schedules and commitments. We have to do this. We have to do these things. We have to follow through on these commitments church and fellowship just kind of happens when it's convenient at life. Spending time with other families, attendance in small group or build or wellspring, the slightest nudge of commitment elsewhere, and those things can easily get overlooked. That's not how we are to guard family time in the household of God. We all benefit from this reminder that we are a part of God's household and his family one of the things that has been the sweetest blessings of my time at Grace Bible Church and now at Gilbert Bible Church is the unique intimacy that we share with each other. I've been distant from this church for a year and a half, part of Gilbert Bible Church. I was a part of this church from its inception, and I can confidently say that for the time that I was part of this church, you did very well at being the household of God. You were our family more intimately than I could possibly imagine. And in the highs of low life, and in the trials and hardships of life, no one cared for us, no one loved us like you all loved us. That's God's grace. That's God's intention. What I love about Grace Bible Church is the deep connectedness and service and care and intimate, loving encouragement for one another. Dear friends, don't lose that. Don't lose that. So keep loving each other. Keep guarding your time together. Keep being involved. Keep caring for one another. Never let yourselves become distant from one another. Never allow yourselves to become a dysfunctional family. Forgive one another. Be connected to one another. Confess sin to one another. Listen, keep short accounts. Humble yourself before one another. Don't hold on to bitterness with one another. Consider others' needs above your own. Pray for each other. Admonish one another. Be admonishable with each other, love each other. The gospel gives you a new identity within the body of Christ, described three ways. First, we are fellow citizens with each other. The next, Paul says, secondly, we're part of God's household. And lastly, for this morning, we are a holy temple in the Lord. We are a holy temple in the Lord. Look again at verses 20 through 22. Paul says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple 
in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Paul says we are, as the church, fellow citizens, that is, the people of God. We are of the household of God, that is, we are a family. And now even more specific, we are a holy temple in the Lord. Paul is using a metaphor for the people of God being built as a temple in the Lord. In verse 20, he talks about the origin and establishment of this temple being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The apostles and prophets were given to the church to bring direct revelation from God to his people. In the Old Testament, a prophet spoke with authority given from God. It was divine authority because they weren't giving their own message, but they were directly giving God's message. The apostles and prophets Paul refers to here were also not speaking on their own authority, but were speaking moved along by the Holy Spirit to give instruction and truth to the people of God in the early church. This truth was to serve as foundational for the people of God in the church. This instruction and revelation given to the apostles and prophets, it was recorded. And it is what we have in our 27 books of the New Testament. So Paul isn't appealing to the reality of some sort of ongoing apostles and prophets for the church that is the perpetual establishment or foundation. He's referring to our New Testament truth from Scripture. This is the foundation that was given to the church. And this truth in our Bible brought to us by God through the apostles and prophets, it's crucially important to the church. You can't overstate the importance and prominence that God's word is to play in the life of the believer individually, but also in the church corporately. And then he draws attention and he says, Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus holds a unique and supremely prominent place in his church. And the foundation of the church, a cornerstone at that time, was the first stone that would be laid in the building of a structure. It needed to be very specific, very precise, carefully chosen. The angles of the cornerstone needed to be exact as when it would be laid, it would become the standard for all of the following stones that would be set. It set both the vertical and the horizontal lines for the whole project. And so everything that followed was based off of that initial cornerstone. It it was what would set the trajectory for everything in that building that was built after it. Thus, the cornerstone was the supremely critical piece to the whole construction. And Jesus is this for the church. He's this for the people of God. He's the foundation and support, the trajectory, and every one of us is to be oriented by and built upon Jesus. Jesus is supreme. In fact, he's the central theme and message of the apostles and prophets of the New Testament, particularly the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross for sins, that he was raised from the dead, that he has taken upon himself the wrath of God for all who would believe for all time, not just in an abstract way, the specific sins of every individual who would believe for all time were placed on Jesus and he bore the just, righteous, holy fury of God and paid for those sins. And in turn, he granted to us his righteousness. He brought us into life, to eternal life in him. The gospel is the foundation of our faith. If you're a Christian, you are only a Christian because of the salvation that comes through Jesus and Jesus as the cornerstone. And so in this, Paul continues to develop this wonderful metaphor saying in verse 21, as Jesus is the cornerstone, we, are, we now are a building being fitted together. We're to be joined together, fitted together. So closely, we're a building together as one. We are fitted together. We're collectively growing. We're maturing together as a holy temple in the Lord. There's profound unity in this.
Paul says you individually are the bricks and you are joined together as the church to be this building, this temple, which is the dwelling place of God, a holy temple. The temple is designed to reflect the greatness and holiness of God who created it. And so we individually are to pursue alongside of one another corporately personal holiness. And we can have hope of this because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. This kind of building up and sanctification, it it doesn't just happen in the believer's life. It doesn't just manifest itself because you attended a service. This comes from shepherding your heart and humble obedience, both to live morally, but also to live corporately, to embrace God's means of grace in your life that he uses to grow you. God does it. It's God's power. God builds us up, and he calls us to get after it. Philippians, work out your salvation, for God is at work in you. You battle sin in your life at the heart level. Invite admonishment and prayer and encouragement, participating in encouragement and spurring one another on. And as we do these things, we collectively are built up into a holy temple, experiencing wonderful unity and intimacy, fearing the Lord together side by side, and then we live out the unity and oneness God desires for his people in the church. It's a testimony to the world. One of the defining ways that the world understands that we love Christ, that we are his, is our love for one another. So here Paul calls us a temple, a dwelling place of God in the spirit. He's pointing out in the same way God in the Old Testament dwelled in the temple in Israel and manifested his presence and glory in that temple, God now dwells within every true believer every saint, and manifests his presence and glory in the people of God, namely in the church. As we, the collective people of God, are joined together, we now together with the Spirit of God dwelling in each of us are the temple of God. This happens again because of Christ, because of his work in the gospel At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit indwells every true believer, and in the same way God filled the temple with his presence in the Old Testament, now he fills believers with his presence in the New Covenant, and his design is a close connectedness for those who are under his grace in the church. He's building us up through this. This is fascinating and so compelling for us. Turn for a moment, well actually we may wrap up here. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter gets at these same realities and describes them for us in wonderful, challenging, and compelling ways. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 Peter says, and coming to him as living stones, and this coming to him, Peter's not talking about coming to him unto salvation. That's not what he's saying here. It's a perpetual, all, always coming to him, continual coming to him post-salvation. So coming to him and continuing to come to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so get this. We are built upon the living stone, Jesus. We come to him continually. We offer our lives, all of us, unto God in worship of God. Everything we think, everything we do, all of our words, our resources, our faculties are to be used for him. We belong to him. We are part of his spiritual house that he is building. Peter says you're being built up. God is doing this. It's passive. You are being built up into this spiritual house for a holy priesthood. And in the original, we can't see it in English as clearly, but in the original, the you also at the beginning of verse five, do you see that? It's plural. 
You learned about this from Omri. Y'all, y'all are being built up. Y'all, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. If you are a Christian, this is true for you. You find this comforting? You ever feel stagnant in your walk with the Lord? Listen, right here, you're being built up. Don't determine your spiritual growth by something as superficial as how you feel in a given moment. God is committed to your spiritual growth. This is why Paul could say that I'm faithful that he who began this work will be faithful to complete it. This is why he can command us to get to work after our sanctification because he knows God is at work in us. God is building us up. His means is connectedness within the body of Christ. His word and his spirit working in us, working in one another, he causes us to be built up. All of those who are his are coming to him. Again, that's part of your identity. You want to talk about identity realities. Peter so connects the Christian's dependence upon Christ that he says, you're being built up. What kind of y'all that are being built up? Y'all that are continually coming to him. That's what Christians do. We come to Jesus over and over and over again. We come to him for help and strength and comfort and guidance and direction. And he never once ever turns away his child. He accepts us and loves us and is gracious with us and in compassionate towards us. And he gives us strength in all that we need to press on for his purposes. He hears every cry. He knows every tear. He's acquainted with every sorrow. Not only that, but he actually answers our prayers. Typically not as we present them, and always much better. Because he answers them in a way that is for our best spiritual good always. Every prayer. That's his commitment to his people, his love for us. We're not to live our lives in isolation from one another. That would be in contrast to who we are in Christ. We're being built up together into Christ's likeness, fitted and joined together with Jesus as our cornerstone. You are being built up as a spiritual house. Y'all are being built up as a spiritual house. For what purpose? Well, look at Peter. Look what Peter says, to a holy priesthood. We know Jesus is the great high priest, but now as a Christian built upon Christ and because of Christ, we have direct access to God. We have direct access to God. And we intimately and personally can worship God and can bring up our offerings to God, not as a means of merit to assuage his wrath. Christ has already done that for us. Not to prove ourselves to God, but in response to his love and work in Jesus, we offer ourselves to God. I can offer my life to God, and I don't need someone else to give me access to him to bring this offering before him. Christ is that for me. I am now part of a holy priesthood because I'm being built upon Jesus. I can offer everything of me constantly to God in worship, and he actually accepts my sacrifice. He accepts my meager offerings. If I tried to offer my life as an acceptable sacrifice prior to salvation, it would just be immediately rejected. But because of Christ, because of his righteousness, I can approach the throne of grace. I can bring my life as a living sacrifice, Paul says in Romans 12, by the mercies of God. I can do this. I can bring my life as a living sacrifice. Holy, pleasing to him. That doesn't originate from within us. Within us. That is the gift of grace that we just sang about. Not I, Christ in me. My flawed attempts and weak efforts, when I fail, there's no condemnation for me, no rejection of me. 
And so the Christian life is not to be a sequence of intermittent offerings unto God. You're a living stone. Part of a holy house in your life now is to be offered up, all of you in worship to God as a living sacrifice. And you do this by continually coming back to Jesus, the immovable cornerstone, the precious cornerstone who secures you and supports you and recalibrates you when needed. And in this, God sees every offering, even the most minute things, private things done to God in service of him, private things done for this church that nobody knows about, no recognition publicly is given to you. God sees every one. They are an acceptable sacrifice to him. They glorify him and they benefit his people or used by him for his glory. from the most meager offerings, the smallest gestures of worship, to the greatest acts of service, they are pleasing to God. God saves us through Jesus, builds us up upon Christ to be joined together as a spiritual house, and because of him we can offer our lives as spiritual sacrifices to him. They are acceptable to God, and this happens through Jesus. One author said it this way, God does not simply dwell among his people, but now within his people and the church collectively is the primary means of how he manifests his glory in the world. You believe that? I think you do. I've seen the way you live as a church. I think you wholeheartedly believe that. Keep believing that. This reality of who we are in Christ, what he has accomplished, what he is building us into. This is why we labor and strive. This is why we give. It's why we sacrifice. It's why we do all of these things in the church to see it built up and then to send out and then repeat because it is crucially important and meaningful as we live our lives in worship of God as the people of God whom he is building up into a spiritual house of God. We need more churches. We need more believers coming to Christ. We need more preaching of the word of God. We need more saints being equipped. The gospel must go forth. People must hear it. It would be heartbreaking if the only endeavors of bringing the gospel elsewhere included endeavors that lacked the church. Wouldn't that be heartbreaking when you understand what God does through his church, what God's intention is for his people connected with one another, the household of God, what he is building? We have to be about this. We have to. So even though it's painful and even though it's tedious and slow at times may not feel as slow the last year and a half for you but it took us 21 years to get there it's worth it it's worth it this is why paul says in chapter 3 verse 21 of ephesians to him be the glory in the church it's important to god it's meaningful in one another's lives it's beneficial for our spiritual growth and devotion to Christ. Paul says, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. We have to be about this work. We have to persist. Don't grow faint-hearted with the hard things that you have to navigate because you are faithful to this. It has been a blessing to be sent out and then to come back and watch things thrive and progress, and people step in, and serve, and take on more, and vigorously pursue spiritual growth so that they wouldn't be hindered in their usefulness for the body of Christ. Well done. Keep it up, and may God receive all the glory. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, 
as we have seen time and time, we know that all of these things are because of your great love demonstrated in sending your son to die on our behalf. This new life that you have given us is wonderful and precious to us because it's found in Christ and he is precious to us as he is precious to you. He wasn't at one point left to our own devices. We hate him, we reject him, we refuse him, we suppress truth about you. We hate you, enemies of you, at enmity with you, but because of your great mercy, you have awakened us, given to us life, reconciled us, forgiven us. And now we have the immense privilege of living our lives, offering ourselves to you in worship, to be about your purposes, joined with each other, being built up. God, your grace is so abundant. Your love is so magnificent. Fill our hearts with love for you in return. Help us to be faithful in our love for one another. Lord, help us to persist in the work that you have set before us. Help us to trust you with the outcome. Help us to be faithful. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.